We are now ready in our lecture series to talk about the spiritual motherhood of Mary. And I, and I want to talk about how the other four dogmas prepare for this and also how we can properly understand Mary's spiritual motherhood amidst the many different terms that are sometimes used to express the relationship between Mary and you and Mary and me and Mary and the human race. First of all, with the proclamation of the dogma of the Assumption of Our Blessed Mother in 1950. Just one month after that definition, we have the International Mariological Community coming together in Rome. And Mariologists from the world over come together, and on December 1st of 1950, they send a petition to Pius XII. And their petition, just one month after this historic dogma, was to, in fact, define the universal mediation of Mary. That is, now that, as the petition would refer to, and, and the, the, the thought behind the petition, the, the theological reasoning that led to the petition uh, would state, now that... The truths about Mary have been defined in virtue of all of her earthly prerogatives. All the things that were granted to her on earth and all the things that she received to fulfill her mission as mother and as the unique partner with Jesus in the work of redemption. Now that that has been established, Mary both in terms of prerogatives given by the Father and in terms of the, her relationship with Jesus. Now, it is time to define, to solemnly define, to dogmatically declare Mary's relationship to humanity. And some might scratch their head and say, well, that's a, that's a tough call. You give the Holy Father one month off and you expect him to put on his infallible hat again uh, in, in an exercise of a, of a charism that's only been used so rarely in history. And that's a fair response, but... My concern, the reason I bring it forward to you, is notice the thinking of the world's principal Mariologists about the fittingness, the appropriateness, that the first four dogmas really prepare the way to talk about Our Lady's relationship between you and me. One author said, and I think there's something to this, that in a certain sense, the first four dogmas can almost appear irrelevant if they don't lead to your accepting Mary as mother. And I think at least what's behind that thought is, yes, the Immaculate Conception and Mary being mother of, of, of God and her threefold virginity and her assumption to heaven are beautiful and proud and sublime and true. But if they don't lead you to seeing Mary as a mother in the order of grace, as the Second Vatican Council, Lumen Gentium 61 would say, then... What's the value of it in virtue of your need to have and, and God's desire for you to have a spiritual mother? So, of course, Pius XII does not grant the petition of that international mariological community that had gathered in Rome, but it still talks about appropriateness and the call to complete Marian dogma. Because there's only one doctrine regarding Our Lady that has not yet been solemnly defined, and that is this doctrine, Mary's relationship to the human family. Mary as the spiritual mother of all humanity, of all peoples, of all nations, of all individuals. Now, we are going to talk about this in the next series of lectures. And here I want to give you perhaps a structure in which to understand the various ways that we talk about Mary as spiritual mother. Some could say, well, I thought she was mediatrix of all graces. And others would say, well, I thought we talk about her spiritual maternity. Still others would say, well, isn't her role as co-redemptrix and her role as our advocate, isn't that part of her spiritual motherhood? My friends, all of those are legitimate terms and titles of Our Lady. But how could we logically organize them uh, from the most general to the most specific. Well, 
I would suggest the following three categories. The first category is the category we'll discuss in this lecture, Mary as spiritual mother. In its most general understanding that Mary is a mother to us in the supernatural order, in the order of sanctifying grace. That we'll call the most general understanding of Mary as the world's spiritual mother, category one. Category two will give us room for examining that same reality, but with a little bit more depth. And category two is the expression of St. John Paul II, Mary's maternal mediation. How does Mary share in the one mediation of Jesus Christ? And how we probably understand uh, terms like Mary as a mediatrix in light of the scriptural passages of places like 1 Timothy 2.5, that there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So, the second category allows a little bit more of a theological and metaphysical examination of the self-same reality, that Mary is our spiritual mother, when we can uh, include and, and further penetrate the concept of maternal mediation. Third category, the third category will be the three specific ways that Mary is indeed a spiritual mother to us. Uh, mothers are nothing if not concrete and practical. So it's legitimate to ask, well, how practically is Mary our spiritual mother? How does she manifest uh, and function as our mother in the order of grace? For category three, when we're asking how does she specifically, how is she specifically mother to you and me? There we come to the three functions. Uh, so we're talking about third category and three functions in this third category. Function one, her role as co-redemptrix. Now, for some, that causes a, an initial knee-jerk reaction. Co-redemptrix sounds like it means equal to Jesus' Redeemer. It certainly does not, and it certainly has never in the long, over seven century history of the church where that title has been used. We'll talk about that in great deal. In summary, my friends, when we talk about Mary's co-redemptrix, think about the mother suffering for us. The mother suffering for us. So that's the first title and role function of Mary as our spiritual mother. Her role is co-redemptrix. The second title and function of Mary as our spiritual mother is that uh, as the mediatrix of all graces. This is Mary as the mother nourishing in the supernatural order, the mother who distributes the graces of redemption. And as we'll discuss and go over these terms, you have to have access to graces to distribute, which means there has to be the acquisition of graces to begin with. And we'll see how much the true Marian role and function as mediatrix of all grace depends on Our Lady's prior role in this maternal order as co-redemptrix. Thirdly, Mary performs the function as mother in what we call the title advocate. Excuse me. And the title advocate is, if you will, the mother pleading for us, the mother interceding for us. And even in some context, the mother protecting us. So, once again, spiritual motherhood is the most general concept of this self-same reality as Mary being the world's spiritual mother. Secondly, we'll examine Mary's maternal mediation and what that means in light of the one perfect mediation of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, we'll talk about the specific ways by which Mary is a mother to us in the order of grace. Number one is co-redemptrix. Number two is mediatrix of all graces, and number three as advocate. Remember, my friends, Our Lady's authentic titles are her functions. They are expressing what she does for the mystical body, what she does for the people of God. They're not just nice honorary titles. They're how she uh, releases her maternal heart 
in love in the order of grace. So, in this lecture, let's just give a fundamental summary of the most general concept of Mary as spiritual mother. Now, in terms of terminology, sometimes you'll hear the, word, the expression divine maternity, again, uh, or spiritual maternity. Well, divine maternity always refers to that first dogma, Mary as mother of God. Spiritual maternity refers to Mary's relationship with us. So, as we're discussing this first category, Mary as spiritual mother, the church means, with that title, and therefore the, the corresponding function, that Mary is the mother of each and every human being in the order of grace. Why does the church hold this, and what is the church's foundations for believing this in the sources of Revelation? Well, first of all, let's go to Scripture. And the first scriptural reference and revelation of Mary as spiritual motherhood uh, really comes forth in the Annunciation, in Luke 1, 28-38. In fact, Mary's fiat. Be it done unto me according to your word, Luke 1, 38. Well, how does Mary's spiritual motherhood of us derive from her saying yes to be mother of Jesus? Because, as St. Augustine will describe, and then in a beautiful quote by Pope St. Pius X, when Mary becomes mother physically of Jesus Christ, the head of the mystical body, Mary also in a mystical way becomes mother, spiritual mother of all the members united to Jesus as head of the body. That means everyone in grace. So, put in, in a more brief expression, as Mary becomes, as Mary gives birth to Jesus Christ, the head of the body, Mary mystically gives birth to each member spiritually united to that head. Uh, I want to read a beautiful quote by uh, Pope St. Pius X on exactly how this happens, at, and, and in fact that it happens. This is in his remarkable Marian, Encyc uh, Marian encyclical uh, Ad Illum Deum in 1904, an encyclical that he wrote after he himself had completed and made the Marian consecration of, at that time, uh, Louis Marie de Montfort, blessed Louis Marie de Montfort, uh, later to become Saint Louis Marie de Montfort. Uh, these are the words of Pius X. Is not Mary the mother of Christ? She is therefore our mother also. He, Jesus, acquired a body composed like that of other men, but as Savior of our race, he had a kind of spiritual and mystical body, which is the society of those who believe in Christ. Consequently, Mary, bearing in her womb the Savior, may be said to have borne also those whose life was contained in the life of of the Savior. All of us, therefore, have come forth from the womb of Mary as a body united to its head. Hence, in a spiritual and mystical sense, we are all called children of Mary, and she is the mother of us all. So you see what is developed by St. Augustine as, as Mary's spiritual, mystical motherhood of those united to Jesus, the head of the body, uh, becomes more fully uh, expressed by uh, Pope St. Pius X in this beautiful element of us being children of Mary. All of us are, in a real sense, uh, mystically conceived in the womb of Mary because Jesus, our physical, and, and the, the physical head of the body and our spiritual, our, our Savior, Indeed, our connection with him makes us also children of the same mother from whom Jesus comes. Now, as we go from Luke 138 to John 19.25, we get more of a clear and, and a direct reference of Mary as spiritual mother of all humanity. In the classic text, Jesus, before 
he dies, as he's paid the price of redemption. But uh, before he completes that process, he, of course, turns to Mary and says, Woman, behold your son. This is John 19, 25 through 27. Woman, behold your son. Now, when he uses that word woman, again, Jesus is connecting Mary with the woman of Genesis, the woman of Cana, the woman of Revelation, even the woman of Galatians 4, 4. She's the woman of Scripture with the God-man of Scripture. So, woman, behold your son. And therefore, John represents a universal redemption. In fact, the popes will rightly articulate that John represents two bodies of individuals, two entities. First of all, John, the beloved disciple, represents all beloved disciples. In a second sense, John goes beyond that in his representation, and he rep represents all humanity. Why? How do we know John represents all humanity? Because the redeeming event of Jesus Christ at Calvary is universal. It's not just for those present. It's for every single human being that has ever existed in human history. And that's why John represents, in, in a special way, all Christians, all beloved disciples, but in a more general way, John represents all of humanity. Let me read a quote from uh, Pope Leo XIII, uh, and then followed by a a congruous quote by St. John Paul II about the representation of John at Calvary. Leo XIII says, and I quote, Now in John, according to the constant mind of the Church, Christ designated the whole human race, particularly those who are joined with him in faith. Uh, this is an 1895 uh, uh, encyclical on Our Lady, Adjuctitum Populi. And then John Paul II will confirm that, and this is in his Marian encyclical, Redemptoris Mater, where he says, and I quote, The mother of Christ, who stands at the very center of this mystery, a mystery which embraces each individual and all humanity, is given as mother to every single individual and all humanity. The man at the foot of the cross is John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, but it is not he alone. Following tradition, the council does not hesitate to call Mary the mother of Christ and the mother of mankind. Indeed, she is clearly the mother of the members of Christ since she cooperated out of love so that there might be born in the church the faithful. Mary's motherhood, which became man's inheritance, is a gift a gift which Christ himself makes personally to each individual. That's Redemptoris Mater, the Pope's encyclical on Our Lady, Mother of the Redeemer, Numbers 23 and 45. And listen, my friends, to what St. John Paul II says. Mary's motherhood is a gift that is given personally from Jesus to you and to me. We don't want to say no thank you. We don't want to reject any gift that Jesus gives us. And it's, and it's significant that this is a gift that Jesus gives to you and me and to all humanity at the end of his passion. That's the value of this gift. And that's why the gift should be cherished as a personal gift from Jesus Christ to every single person on earth. It's a gift of his mother. What an extraordinary gift. So it's a gift that tells us that God the Father wants us to have both a father in the spiritual order, but also a mother in the spiritual order. That's why Pope Francis has commonly said that without Mary, the Christian is an orphan, at least a partial orphan by not having Mary as a spiritual mother. So, we want to accept this gift that Jesus gives to us, the gift of Mary as our spiritual mother. So, Jesus says, Woman, behold your son. And then he says to John, Behold your mother. In the Latin, Ecce Mater Tu. Again, this is not Jesus saying, Would you like my, Mary, my mother as your mother? It is the statement of a theological fact, even though it is 
a, a, an infinitely valuable gift. He's saying, Mary is now your mother. It's your task as a Christian to behold her. So again, the question of the Christian, how do I do that correctly? How do I do it reverently? How do I do that in a way that Jesus wants me to do it? How do I obey Scripture by beholding Mary as mother? That's something that every Bible-believing Christian should respond to. Just as every Bible-believing Christian should be asking the question, how do I obey Luke 1.48? Uh, that all generations will call me blessed, Our Lady says. How am I supposed to do that? Well, I believe Scripture. I believe in the inspiration of Scripture, and I believe that these are things indeed that are contained therein, and therefore I have, a, I have an obligation in love to behold Mary as mother. And one quick response on how to do this well is to imitate John. John takes Mary into his home. And again, in the Greek, there's no word for home. It's actually Mary... Uh, that, excuse me, that John takes her into his own, into his interior life, as St. John Paul II would say, into his inner life. So to bring, to properly respond to this gift means to accept the gift of Mary's motherhood, to bring her into our hearts, to acknowledge her as what Jesus designates her to be, our mother. Not mother in the physical order, obviously, but mother in the spiritual order, in the order of grace, in the order of the kingdom of God, in the supernatural order that Christ comes to establish and does establish at the price of his blood. And so we want to accept Mary as mother. Now, in terms of the fathers of the church, this was clear from the beginning. Their whole uh, concept, the first Marological concept of, of Our Lady as the new Eve means that Mary is the new mother of the living. She's our new spiritual mother. She was called the second Eve. The first Eve was designated as the mother of the living. We see that in Genesis 3. This new Eve is also a mother to us in this spiritual order. And we'll talk uh, in the following lectures about how she manifests this so powerfully and, and so sublimely in history and, and in our own day. But we want to start with the fact, the theological fact, that it's the case. Now, in terms of the magisterium, from Pope Sixtus IV in, in, in 1477 to Pope Francis, every single Holy Father has taught the doctrine of Mary's spiritual motherhood. Now, this is clearly established as a reality that calls each one of us to respond in gratitude and in a type of filial love, filial meaning a, a son or daughter-like love. So, we're going to end here with this concept, this, this most general concept of Mary as our spiritual mother. And in the next lecture, we're, we're going to examine how can we reconcile Mary as spiritual mother in a complementary way to the reality that Jesus Christ is the one mediator between God and man. And as we'll see, no one but no one will participate in the one mediation of Jesus more profoundly, more effectively, and more lovingly than the mother of Jesus, than the mother given to us by Jesus from the cross. Thank you. God bless.